Let us pray. In Jesus' name. Father Lord, we thank you once again. Giving us an opportunity to count our blessings. And to name them before you one after the other. Father Lord, since we started this fellowship, you have been blessing the work of our hands. You have blessed us in every side. Father Lord, that's why this night we stand before you to count our many blessings. And to name them before you one by one. Father Lord, we give you glory. We thank you for as many that will join us in counting their blessings tonight. As many that will join to listen and to hear what we have to say. Lord, let their blessing overflow. And give them the grace to be able to stand and count their many blessings. And to name them before you one by one. Father, you have blessed us. Every day we wake up, we slept, we breathe in and we breathe out. Father Lord, all came from you. Now another year is about to end. You save us from the beginning of the year towards this ending. What shall we say therefore? If God be for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his son. He gave him as an atonement for us. We know through him, he will give us all things. We thank God for the grace he has given to us. We thank him for the Holy Spirit he has poured on those that love him. Father, we are about to learn from you. It is only you that can teach us exactly what you want us to learn. Give us the grace to stand aware of your presence, to stand in your favor, and to learn from you. Because no man can say or do anything except it is given to him from above. Lord, you alone can teach us tonight. Holy Spirit, come in your grace. Make known to us the interpretation of your word. Teach us wisdom. Grant us understanding that in everything your name alone may take preeminence. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Tonight you are welcome to our Open House Fellowship. Today's teaching is going to be very precise. And we are going to be happy to go through it with you. And today's teaching is known as Christian Christ Leadership Style. Or in another way today we will be calling Christian Leadership Style. Christ Leadership Style is something that every would-be Christian or missionary should learn the principle. Because it helps us to understand that God has a pattern which he wants us as believers to follow. And this pattern was set forward by Christ himself. Christ has a leadership style which he wants Christians to follow his footsteps. And these leadership styles are not something very strange. It's known as servant leadership. Servant leadership is a thing often used to describe how Jesus led. Jesus, when the supper was over, carried a bowl of water and he kneeled down, wrapped towel around his waist and washed the disciples' feet. Many of us may not know the significance of this event, but if you search the scripture, you will understand that in Hebrew, it is only meant for servants to wash their master's feet. But this case, on the contrary, Master was washing their servant feet. And this is the kind of leadership God requires from the church. Meaning, who must be the head among you? Let him be the servant to all. Do you want to be the head or a lead in God's house? God is not against you being a leader, but you must take upon yourself the form of a servant. Even he will make it clearer to us. As Christ being the form of a God, taught it not as a robbery thing to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And he humbled himself, being formed and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself. And he became obedient, even to the point of death. This is Christ's type of leadership. A leadership should not stop when things are difficult or we change our format because things are not going our way no that's not christ's form of leadership christ's form of leadership hold 
turn to obedience even to the point of death. That means in leadership you don't always expect to succeed. But sometimes you might. But other times you may not succeed. It might lead you to the point of death. But your quality should not diminish because you are in peril or because your life is threatened or because you are at the point of death. That is Christ's system of leadership. And that leadership, we are going to check the scripture. Our uh, text tonight is taken from the book of Matthew. I would like to read from chapter 5. Chapter 5. From verse 7. He said, Blessed or happy to be envied or spiritually prosperous with life full of joy and satisfaction to God's favor and salvation. Regardless of our upward condition, at the mercy. We're going to look at Christ's leadership under the area of mercy. Mercy. A leadership must have mercy or compassion, what we call compassion, on those he leads. A leadership without compassion does not has any quality to be called a leader. Leader must have mercy on his followers. Yes, for example, you lead a church or a group of church, you have strict rule against sexual immorality and other things. And one of your converts fall into such trap by the enemy and was deceived into having such sexual immorality. What do you do? Now the offense has been committed. Before the offense has been committed, you have a strict rule against it. But now the offense is committed. What do you do as a minister? Your leadership quality will show forth how you handle such conditions. Are you going to say, oh, because you have done this, you are here by this bank from the church? No. As a leader, you are going to calm down. Because now the offense has been committed. What you, you should focus on, your paramount goal as a leader, is not to lose that comfort. Not to make him feel rejected and dejected to the extent he will pull out of the congregation. What you should do is wash him, take him up, clean him up, and put him back to the service of the Lord. Whatever correction practices or form you are trying to make in your church should not be a form of punishment, but rather a form of correction to be able to strengthen and put that convert back to service even before he knows it. But while doing that, you should consider yourself to ensure that those sins are not being legalized in the congregation. That is Christ's forms of leadership. And that's why the Bible says, blessed or envied are those who are merciful. Because if you show mercy on people, you also will obtain mercy. Do you know why? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Because if you show no mercy, the Lord also will show you no mercy. Because your mercy you show on others triumph over your own personal judgment. That's why as a leader, mercy is very important. There came a time in David's life, Saul pursued after David, sought his life, even killed the prophets that welcomed David. David was handed the head of Saul on a platter of gold in an open field in the night. And even the servant of David said, Master, just allow me, just once, let me take off away the head of Saul. But what did David say? God forbid that I should lay my hands against the Lord's anointed. Because the Lord will not hold him guiltless that lay his hands against the Lord's anointed. But this time we are talking, the Spirit of God has departed from Saul. An evil spirit from the Lord has entered Saul. But as far as David is concerned, he is still the Lord's anointed. And he should not be touched. And because he showed mercy and would not take the life of Saul, even at the point the mercy he showed on Saul triumphed over his own personal judgment. So that is why, as a Christian, you must take the path of mercy if you must be a successful leader. A leader who punishes is a tyrant, not a leader. Leaders does not focus on punishment. Leaders focus on mercy, compassion, 
And this is one of the rare qualities in leadership. So a servant leader, Christ-centered leadership, one of the saints, is the distinction between a servant leader and Christ-centered leader. Human hands once the story of a band of men on mystical journey. The central figure in the story is Liu, who accompanied the party as a servant. He does many chores for the groups, but he also sustained them with positive attitude and with song. Liu is a person of extraordinary presence, but all goes well for the band of men until Liu disappeared, at which time the group fell into disarray and their journey is about and they cannot make it without Liu. Some years later, Liu is formed and taken into order that sponsor the journey. As it turns out, Liu the servant was the head of the order and a noble leader. He would have been a servant, just look at what the activity of Liu. He, all he demonstrated was just positive attitude. He served the people food when they needed it. He entertained them with song. He made the journey more merry for them. And when they were discouraged, he encouraged them. But they have a leader for the journey who is the boss, who goes forward with all the money, all the attitudes. And supposed to be the head of the team, but he was not. But the real leader in that team was Liu, who was what the servant of all, who was the servant, being able to harmonize unity in the midst of this array group, being able to bind the group together to achieve a positive outcome. Remember, when we talk about mission, many people always think mission is a calling. Mission is a destination. God gives you. A mission. Your mission is either to go and save a town, save a country, save the world, save a village. And when God sent you on that mission, your job is to achieve an objective. The leader job is to analyze the team. Because no one man can carry out a mission. A mission needs a team. And for team to be harnessed, the leader must be a servant to all. Being able to harmonize the strengths of and the weakness of each member of the team to bring out positive objective. This is the duty of servant leader. And a servant leader, as a servant, is an ideal leader first came to the story of God in this particular book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. He said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? Obtain mercy. Because while you go, you're going to come across several people on the way. Some of them deserving, others not so much. But the leadership you announce will determine the outcome of your team. Then let's go to Matthew chapter. 5 verse 8 where it said blessed are you regardless of your condition when your heart is pure blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God a servant leader must have a pure and a clean heart a heart that is free from the world because when we talk about purity, so many Christians do not understand that purity does not simply imply sinless. Purity imbibes a heart free from grudge, malice, anger, frustration, bitterness. And when your heart is free from those things, you'll be able to carry the thing. A thing that is suspicious of one another will not go very far. Because as a leader, your job is to make sure that the team lives in harmony. And so, because of that, purity of heart must be entertained. Because a servant leader is used to describe everything that demonstrates integrity, kindness, to employ more attractive leadership style in order to make the workforce for greater productivity. 
For a servant leader to be able to bring the workforce to better productivity, he himself must be pure, must be transparent. And being transparent means you also, your team must likewise be transparent. Because if your team discover that you are hiding things away from them, they in turn will hide things away from you. And that is one of the attitudes a servant leader must possess if he must go forward. What is Christ-centered leadership differ? It is the first and foremost of the following of Christ. It's about personal gain. It's about sacrifice. It's about utilitarian model to achieve success. It's Christ's example to follow because it is right. The word Christ-centered leadership requires settled resolve. Resolve to reflect the following characteristic of Christ's leadership in our own life. Christ's type of leadership in verse 9. He said, Blessed. Blessed are the, those who maintain peace or peacemaker. For they shall be called the sons of God. In the midst of battle, do you fry up things as a leader? Do you strong up the arms of your followers to achieve your goal? You have to force people to work extra time. Then you have to force people to swallow the time of their lunch and force fasting. They will end up in hunger strike rather than fasting is a self fast unto God. Do you force people to become what you are? No leader is meant to convert people to himself. A leader is to help people achieve their desired potential. And by so doing, they will arrive at the same objective, but differs at come. So don't expect the call in your head to be transferred automatically to your follower. Expect the call to be understood by your follower. And let that same understanding be their driving force to achieve their own personal objective. And that is a servant leader. And that was Christ's system of leadership. Christ's system of leadership was grounded in relationship, not force thinking, not mandatory obligation, not strong arm tightness, not control. He wants a relational a relationship. That was the same reason God did not convert us to robots. It would have been easier, instead of allowing sin on earth, to just make a human race of robots. So that whenever he says, go right, we go right. Do the right thing, we do the right thing. Do the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing. That would be easier. But God did not want us to be with that free will. God wanted us as a man to think for himself. He wanted us to be able to have compassion, to be able to ascribe differences. Our productivity is not based on control. It is true that when people are controlled, they do more work, but they think less. Just check, for example, let's take our industrial setting, where we make robots do almost 90% of the work. Robots can be very efficient in productivity, but they are not very good thinkers. Even with the best artificial intelligence, man still needs to input data and to sort it out. And so, because of that, they are not good thinkers and they are not able to have emotion or feeling or private time or put emotion into their work. So, because of that, human being is always necessary. No matter how you view man, how deficient we are, how inadequate we feel, but we are five million times more better than robots, even the best artificial intelligence. Because one, we are able to have emotion, to feel. We know when to disagree, and we know when to continue stretch. So some leaders want to convert their citizens to robots, so that whenever they speak, nobody objects. Everybody just say yes even when they don't like the decision. 
And social media can be a very powerful tool for that. But God said clearly, He doesn't want that from us. That's why He told us to prove all things. He wants us to have our own opinion. Second guess everything, even though we are great. He doesn't really give us the chance of insubordination. But what he taught us is we have to prove all things. You know the truth. The truth is handed to you on a platter of gold. But your job is to take the truth to the lab. Check it out for yourself. Do research on the truth. And find out whether that truth you were told is actually true. And if the truth is true, you hold on to it. But if it is not true, you disgust it. And that's what God expected from every believer. God does not expect Christians to go to the church because the church is perfect place. Or because the church is the pastor of that place can be trusted. No. God expects you to go there to find out the truth for yourself. When you get to church, you sit down like every member. You accept the word of God gladly. Then you open your Bible, search if what you were told in the church were true. That's what God expects from us. Even if you go to the mosque, they say, God does not expect you to follow the Quran blindly. God expects you to take it, accept it. Any man that brings knowledge, don't throw it away. But search if what you were told were true. Before you go fighting over something you do not believe in, take up your scripts, write down some notes. Take the Bible verse you were given. Set it. Does what the pastor say, does it match what the Bible says? Does it match what is written in the word of God? That's why the Bible told you that the scriptures is written by inspiration of God and is teachable for doctrine, for reproof and for correction, so that the man of God can be equipped in every good work. The whole scriptures not some part of it, not some selected scriptures, but all scriptures are given by inspiration of God. And so therefore search the scripture, because in it you think they have, you have life. They testify of one man, Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, we are written all about him. And even the volume of the books. And he make it clear, how do we know that what God says will come to pass? That is the question many Christians ask themselves on a daily basis. We hear that the world will end sometime, that God will return, Christ will return for the church. What time? How are we sure? But he said to you that not a yacht or a quote from the books of the law will fail without being fulfilled. That tells you that everything the Bible writes about will come true. It doesn't matter how small. Even a dot will not be taken out of it. So as a Christian, you should hold on to it. I have seen a lot of vision in my lifetime. Even some of them that have astonish you that you will not believe they are true. But above those vision, above those revelation, I believe the word of God. The word of God is a light to my path and a lamp to my feet to guide and to save me from sin. To show me the heavenly way. And that is what I need. The word of God should be enough to show me the heavenly way. God teaches us a leader we should ascribe to have. The kind of leader. But not many Christians today are encouraged with that kind of leadership. God told us the kind of leader that we should have. In the Bible. He told us that leaders should be sober. He should do more work than his fellow leaders. And that leadership, take for example in Genesis 49 verse 10. He said the section or leadership shall not depart from Judah, nor ruler staff from between his feet, until Shalom, the Messiah, the peaceful one comes. Because to whom belongs the obedience of his people or the gathering of his people. So, who is Shalom? And who is the Messiah, the Prince of Peace? Jesus Christ. That means God is saying to the people of Judah, 
that the century, Judah was not the first one. Judah was not the first one. But he was chosen as king in place of the firstborn. Why? Because the firstborn of Jacob went and defied his father's bed. That's why the tribe of Judah was taken. And the tribe of Judah was taken in place of the firstborn. And in the tribe of Judah, and Benjamin was the first king in Israel, not Judah. But Benjamin lost their right of kingship because Saul listened to the people rather than listening to God. A leader must understand the difference between command and obedience. A leader should have mercy does not mean he should break the rules of his commanding officer. Mercy and breaking the rules of your commanding officer are two different things. Because Saul was a kind king. He obeyed God, but more, he loved the people more than he loved God. He obeyed the people. He was a man of the people. Because the people chose him to become king. So he does everything to please the people. And as a result, he lost the kingship. Because the kingship was not a tool for the people. So as a leader, you must understand that the person that sends you or makes you a leader or in charge of your mission, he is a real leader of a team. That's why the Bible told you every authority is subjected to the higher. And the highest of all authority is God. Your pastor may be your earthly guardians in the church, but you don't take authority from him. Your authority comes from God because God is the head of all things. And because God is the head of all things, you should learn to second guess every statement or decision you receive from man. By listening to the pastors, taking it before God, and searching the scriptures, if what you were told were actually true. But if they are not true, you should not listen. And that's what the Bible says about leadership. It says, let the Lord pass over before the servant, and I will lead to on slowly and govern by and govern by the light stocks that set pace before me and endurance of the children until it comes to the Lord in Sarah. Why would the Lord pass before his servant? Because the Lord is the actual leader of the team. And where we are reading from is Genesis 33, from verse 14. He makes us understand that the Lord is the head of the team. And because the Lord is the head of the team, so let the Lord God of hosts be ahead of you. And when he is ahead, all you need to do is follow. It's not difficult to lead when you have a blueprint. The blueprint was already written for you. And God has put the blueprint of becoming a leader to you. That's why He sent you Christ. What leadership example can we learn from Christ? One, we knew He was the form of God. We can understand that in John 1, verse 1. Let's read. John 1, verse 1. What does this say in John? He said, John 1, 1. John 1.1, 1, 1, I'll read. I'll read from verse 1. Read. John 1.1. 1, 1. So Christ's leadership was grounded in relationship rather than control. Foundation to Christ's leadership was his relationship with his disciple. Rather than existing asserting control over the team, he did something else that was astonishing. 
in the life of the team. Christ revealed a genuine care about them. How does he show his care? When they were sick, he healed them. When they were hungry, he fed them. And when they were discomforted, he comforted them. And when most of them were confused, they don't have genuine answer to their question, he took them in secret and exposed it to them. What reserving their pride? There is one thing men value more than any other thing. That's their pride. So as Christians, always understand your team and try to preserve their pride so that they can stay honest with you. Don't reprove an elder, for example, in public. Take him to a secret place. Tell him exactly where he is wrong. He will listen to you. But if you stand before the open church to expose an elder, he will hate you for it. He will not take it as correction. He will take it as insubordination. So because of that, leadership with genuine care do well in leadership. So thus, he earned their trust. Even when they had hard teaching, when he told them that a certain eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are not my disciple anyway. I told you, not many of us on earth today will listen to such statements, but the disciples they did. They did listen. Do you know why? Because they knew their master, Jesus Christ, can never lie. And that is one thing your, your students should know about you. Do your children trust you enough to know that it is impossible for you to lie to them? That is the question you must ask yourself every day as you wake up. John 1.1 1, 1. I'll read from verse 2. It said, He was God in the beginning. But if you read from verse 1, He said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, He was God. He was with God in the beginning. So, He knew about the creation. Through Him, all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. Because in him belongs life. The life we who and I are living are his own. And that life was the light that we enjoy today. It's known as the light of men, mankind. And that light shines in darkness. And darkness cannot overcome the light. And there was a man sent from God who exposed this thing. How did we know this? We have a forerunner, we have a testimony from somebody who witnessed this time, who was a witness prophet, and his name was John. The Bible gives us his name. He was John, even his death. We know his birth was miraculous death from Elizabeth, who was past age. And we knew about this. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light that through him we might believe. He himself was not the light, but only to witness to the light. And remember what he said. He said, I don't even know him. I've never seen him. But the man has sent me to baptize with water. Say, so upon whom I shall see the Spirit of God descending <coughs> in form of a dove. We should know that this is the man that baptized with Holy Ghost and with fire. And now I have clear witness and record that what I have said are the truth. That was John's testimony about him. Why am I bringing you to this? I want you to understand that Christ, he was not just the son. He was in the form of a God, but he humbled himself. So being a leader does not mean that God, the Holy Spirit, filled you and you are full of power. And all your team obeyed you. And they, some of them that have land sold it. They have cars, they sold it. They bring the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What do you do with it? Do you just put it in the bank and use it to buy the latest jets or the latest house? Or what do you do with it? Do you use it to benefit the poor in your church? To ensure 
that the teams continue to propagate the gospel, why that money was given in the first place? Or do you claim it for yourself? That characteristic we are test for your leadership style. If your leadership style is a genuine leadership style, you will save the things of God, not earthly things. Remember, we are pilgrims, and as pilgrims, we have no continuing safety on earth. Yes, God blesses us most of the time, but the blessings are not our own. I remember long ago when God revealed to me soulful talents in the mission, and I begin to ask myself, God, when will I be able to use all these talents? He said, son, they are not your own. They are not your own. I reveal it to you so that you can hand over to the people when they come, so that they can use it for the betterment of my kingdom. And that's exactly what you need to learn. The talent, the wisdom you receive from God, they are not your own. After all, you never labor for it. You never went to university to study that particular angle of how to raise the dead, how to heal the sick, how to do wonders in the name of God. Nobody teaches you that in Bible school, but you get it directly from God as a gift. So what should the gift be used for? Are you like that wicked man who received the talent from the Lord and went and dig it in the earth, saying, I know my master is wicked and shrewd, so that when he comes, I will take that which he says and give it back to the master? Or are you that man that puts the Lord's work to use you? And using the talents that God gave to you to empower life, to save the lost, to gather souls for his kingdom, so that when he returns, he will be glad. And he will take that which that one has done on the earth and add it to you already in the half time. And so the Bible says, the one that has none, even the little he has will be taken away. But the one who has much and others, even more will be given to him. The Lord is saying to you today, make good use of your talent. Don't use your talent for corrupt practices, to make yourself rich in the earth. The Bible says, where do you lay your treasure? Are you putting your hope and treasure in the earth where thief can break in? Where moth and rot don't corrupt? Or will you rather put your talent in heaven? Where no teeth can break in. Where no moth can corrupt. The Bible says that every man's work will be tested by fire. Ask yourself, if your cathedral is tested by fire, will it survive? Or will it be burnt? The Lord is asking you a question today. Ask yourself, today if Christ decides to come and test my work, will my work survive? Will I myself survive the fire? The test of fire is coming. For every believer. And the Lord says every man works will be tested by fire. By fire you also will be saved. If you are done right, you will receive the reward for your labor. But if your work is not, you will suffer loss. Do you want all your 30 something years of work in the ministry? Your 15 years of work in the ministry? Your 110 years work in the ministry? Do you want it to be burnt on the last day? Is that how you want it to end? What shall it profit a man if this whole world is your church and your gain and your reward and you lose your soul at the end? What reward have you on earth? What blessing can man give you that equal the gift of your soul? What riches can you get in the world that equal the glory of heaven and the passion of the things to come? What wealth can you really amass you for yourself in this life that will equal the salvation that Christ promised to those that love him. And that is the question you should ask yourself clearly. As a leader, remember your mercy triumphs over judgment. What do you do in your church? Do you have a rich man with a good ring and they come into your congregation and you say, come sit right here at my right hand? And you say to the poor who has no clothes and dirty clothes and you say, sit here at my foot because you are not qualified? Is that how you lead your church? Remember what God says. He said, on the last day, I will judge between the fat cow and the snake cow. Does God really care about cow? Is he not talking about us? He's going to judge between this thin member in your church and the fat one. He's going to judge between the rich member and the poor member in your church. How fair you have dealt with them. 
And that is what God is asking you tonight. And He's asking you only one question. Was you honest in your conversation with your team? Do they know that the money you collected from them is not going to be used to build the kingdom of heaven? That the money is going to go into your private bank account so that you can make yourself rich and make yourself fat from the offerings of the Lord? Remember what happened to the children of Eli because they ate the sacrifice that was meant for the house of the Lord. And the Bible says they fell on the battlefield. And because of them, God delivered his strength into captivity. The act of the covenant of Israel was taken into captivity because they defied the offer that was meant for the house of the Lord. What does it mean? Why did the Lord say you should take tithes? He said so that the widows and the orphan will feed. So that the poor in the church might be careful. That is the reason for your tithe and offer. What about the mission? Today, missionaries have to fend for themselves. You cannot open website without looking, seeing one missionary side or the other, begging for money to go for outreach. Because the church will not sponsor mission. They rather sponsor church planting. As a result, church is concentrated in a particular small region. Why the rest regions remain in total darkness? Because the Great Commission cannot finish. So Christ cannot return. Not even Christians today are praying for the Lord's return. Even when Christ told us that when we pray, we should say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. But today, not many Christians say, Your kingdom come. Because they don't want God's kingdom to come. Because they are not prepared. The bridegroom has stained himself with the world. The bridegroom has put on the garment of sin, rather than the garment of righteousness, to meet with the Lord in the end. And the Lord is saying, the leadership quality you possess will determine your outcome. And that leadership Christ has said from us is that we knew Jesus genuine care about his followers. And we as a leaders must also follow Christ's example. When he knew that the followers had stayed in the conference ground for three days, they must be hungry. I cannot send them away like this without transport. If they go, they will faint up the way. And so he faint them. What about you? Do you care about your team? Or you care only about yourself? How many members came to the church? How much offering and donation came in? But you never really care about the people who are given those money. Do you have a farm? Do you only care for the milk that came from the cow? Not for the straw that they will eat? Or for the water they might drink? The Lord says, that if you have a cow, you should not only care for the milk, but also care for the straw, which the cow might eat. And thus, he and their trust, when even his word and action were difficult to understand and receive, they understood it. Because why? Even when he told them and said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. They listen. The reason is because they end his trust. Do your member trust you? Does your church member, can they stand for you? When people say that man is a rapist, that man is an adulteress, that man sleep with people's wife, would your member trust you and say, we don't believe it? Will your church still be filled on Sunday if such report is made about you? Does your member trust you enough to stand for you in the midst of opposition? That is the question you should ask yourself. Jesus' leadership was activated by influence rather than hierarchies. He was not saying, you, you have been with me for five years, so you are the coordinator. You have been with me for three years, you are bishop, so so and so. You have been with me for 15 years, you are evangelist, so so and so. That was not Christ's system of leadership. Christ's leadership was activated by influence rather than delegated position of authority. All men were equal. If they have leadership forums or stars, one of the disciples would not have come to Christ and said, who will be the head in the kingdom of heaven? They would have known already. But because they were all equal, and because they were equal, they were concerned, who is going to be the head of this apostleship? Who is going to sit at your right hand? And who is going to stay in your left hand? 
who is going to be the chairman and who is going to be the vice president because they did not know. So your leadership in the church should be the same. Your members should not know who is the deacon and who is the elder or who is the pastor or who is the prophet, who is the evangelist and who is the preacher. But all men should be equal because God created us equal. And by so doing, even the least gifts can be more effective in the open church. And Jesus' leadership was not accomplished through, arm, through strong arm cohesion. He did not strong arm anybody to be forced into some spiritual maneuver. Despite his own unrevived spiritual authority, Christ's leadership was not in order to accomplish true strong arm cohesion. Instead, people chose to follow. Choice. Your leadership should be by choice. Because the hiring would run away at a certain time. Because he's hired. You pay him salary. And when the money is no longer come, he resign. And when the money is not big enough, you see somebody that will pay more, he will run away. But the shepherd will save the sheep. The shepherd will not run because the salary is small. He will not run because the sheep are sick. He will not run because the wolf are coming. Tell me, how much will somebody give you to that? And that is the question you should ask yourself every morning. When you keep asking, the offering in that church, the salary is too small. How much will somebody pay you to that? No, no. If you want to come to mission to be paid, I will be very happy to welcome you. But the truth is, how much money will you be paid so that when you die, it will be enough? The question you should ask yourself on a daily basis when you wake up, what happens if you go to the first village and it is the villager grow angry and decide to mock you to death? How much salary will be enough for you? So how much salary do you really think it is worth us putting our life in danger for? Going from village to village, going from one spiritual stronghold to the next one. Do you really think money is enough to buy your influence in the kingdom of God? Do you really think money is what mission is about? No. The kingdom of God is in power, righteousness, and strength in the Holy Ghost. It has nothing to do with your monetary gain. And that's why missionaries are not looking for people with big pockets. They are looking for people who will put their life on the line. Who will surrender their souls to God. Who has believed God to the point they believe in their heart that God is enough and is worth dying for. But the heart cannot believe that God is worth dying for. He is only there for his passion. And for his spirits. And when he is hired, when trouble comes, he will run. That is if he is able to escape before he is killed. Instead, people choose to follow him. To reject. That's why his disciples were sworn in two. Some of them were hung to the cross, stoned to death. They never left. And what about Stephen? Stephen was restored. And all he could say is, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. That is a man with conviction. That is a true leader. Leader that will not run on the face of opposition, or trial, or tribulation, or pain, or even parade of death. Those are the leaders God is looking for this same time. That will carry his gospel from one corner of the world to the end of the world. Not Christians. That will run away because the people in that region are hostile. No. If you don't preach the gospel, who will? If you don't share the good news to the wicked, who will give it to them? If you keep running away, who will not preach? Who is qualified to die? Who do you hire to go and die on your behalf? Who is going to take the gospel to the violent man? Remember the Bible says, no man goes into a strong man's house. Except he first bind the strong man. Who will not bind the strong man for you if you keep running away? The strong man needs to be bound, hand and feet. And that is only when you can succeed to plunder his house. If there was no strong man, why would God told you to bind one? Oh, if the kingdom of God is not meek and bread. You have all through your life drink meek. But time has come 
that as Christians, as leaders in the church, to eat from bone. And those who are matured in the spirit, they crack bone. They don't drink meek. Meek are for babes who are unskilled in the world. Instead, people choose to follow Jesus. They choose him. Others also reject the invitation and turn him away. He was never forcing them. See, if you don't follow me, you will go to hell. That was not his teaching. Human can freedom to choose was one of God's most profound displays of true leadership. Ability to choose what is right, what is wrong. That's why after he saved the children of Israel from all the plague in Egypt, took them through the Red Sea. And the children of Israel, Moses sits them down in a tent and said, This is the land of promise. And he said to them, I said before you life and death, before you blessing and curse. But I can't sell you in the name of God. Choose life. So that you and your children will live. The same thing God is saying to your heart this month. And he's asking you one question. I have said before you blessing and curse. Life and death. But I can't sell you. Please choose life. Choose life so that you and your children and your generation might live and not die. That is what God is asking. But what question are you asking? What answer are you ready to give? Are you telling God that, sorry, I don't need your life. I want to choose death. Or I don't need your blessing. I want to choose cause. God has said before you, this is the blessing of Abraham through Christ. By accepting salvation. And what is the blessing? Your name will become a blessing. Every man on earth through you will be blessed. I will bless them that bless you. And I will curse them that curse you. Through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. This is a blessing. But the other side, rejection of Christ is cause. Don't do that. Separated from the covenants and learn from the commonwealth of Israel. Waiting the untold hardship and the tribulation and the fire that will consume the adversary. So which side do you want to go? Do you want to go with God or you want to go with the world? In the world, you will have tribulation. In me, Christ said, you will have peace. So we choose. That is your choice. And that choice is still profound. No matter how powerful God is, it's not going to force you to serve him. He's not going to restrict you like the leaders of the world from hearing the truth. He's not going to restrict you from listening to occultic nonsense. He's not going to stop you from hearing what you want to hear. He's going to put the trust open for you. And you believe you have the ability to design between good and evil. After all, we ate the fruit. And because we can design between good and evil, we have the ability to choose what is right or to choose what is wrong. So no man will die for another man's sin. Every man will die for his own sin. And that's why as a leader, you must be profound in your warning your teaching, your guidance, but do not force people to serve under you. Because God does not force man to serve. Neither does God force demons to be delivered. God brings the option of freedom to them. It is their choice to make. Human freedom to choose was one of God's most profound displays of his true leadership. A restored relation with God that is dependent on person choice is central to the gospel message. Because when you hear the good news, the good news is not about us. The good news is about God blessing, God kindness, God meekness, God favor, God freedom, if you choose to accept it. But it's not going to force you to accept it. It's not going to carry sword and conquer a village and force them to convert. That is not one of God's prerogatives. He has the strength to do it. But throughout history, there was never a way God was forced in his conduct. And anyone that tried to force people to serve God, he's not forcing them to God, he's forcing them to himself. 
And the restored leadership of God is that is dependent on a person's choice. To central of the gospel message, Christ did not use hierarchical structure to manage people. No. Instead, he invested in relationship to influence the people. So as Christians, our focus should be on Christian relationship, not first leadership. Christ focused on followers' potential rather than their production. What ability do you have? It's not what you say. It's not your production, but your potential. We can work with that. Remember what David did? When Saul was after his life, he ran away. Who came to him? Was he the prominent man in the land? Was it the rich and the wealthy? No. Those that were in debt. Those that were in trouble. They were the one that came to him. And they became the mighty men of David. What about Jephthah when he was chased away by his brother? The weak and defenseless men. The men who of noble characters. Those that were in debt were the one that came to Jephthah. And Jephthah grew them and made them his strong army. And so today, what kind of leader are you? Are you looking for a ready made or perfected saints? No. Leaders look for the weakest. Leaders look for harlots. Leaders look for sinners. Leaders look for the thieves, the corrupt, the awkward neighbors. He gathered them together and he made them the mighty men of God. This is whom a leader is. A leader is not looking for a place where Christianity is now 150 years old. Where everybody is singing amazing grace. A leader is looking for a place where all can have dominions. He's looking for a place where witches fly in the day. He's looking for a place where demonic entities are in control. And that is the place he gathered his team. And I tell you, the one God forgive most, the same love more. The one God forgive little, they say love little. And God is looking for those who He forgive more. And those people you will see the love of God blossom in their heart. Because they are the edge when God saved them. But those who God forgive little, they say we love only little. Leaders are part of capacity, design, develop the followers' potential. He saw God, He saw people as God image bearer. That is whom leaders see people. They don't see failures in people. They don't see people as a tool or a means to achieve an end goal. No. They saw future forwards by their collective spirit and power genius. He is consistent and demonstrates altruistic commitment for each individual to each of their own highest kingdom potential. The radical priority of their followers grew to their maximum kingdom potential and was at the heart of Christ's life and ministry. He never had a prominent community or organization position. No, he never did. And so you should not choose to hold one. Christ did not contest or cancel up. He did not contest to be the stripes or the Pharisees. Even when they want to forcefully make him a king, he ran away. So you should also run away when they want to make you a politician. Because you cannot save God and the world together. You have to choose one. The radical priority that his followers grew to their maximum kingdom potential was at the heart of Christ's life and ministry. He never prominent community or organization position was not part of his kingdom plan. He did not seek success according to standard organization measure. Rather, he took up this task of influencing the commitment of those who would carry the torch after his departure. Leaders should have a successor, not family members. Leaders should have a successor from their ministry, from those they save. They should have one or two, or even twelve, that should be able to say, I know what my master teaches me. That's why the Bible says the man who knows his master will and do what it is blessed. 
But the man who knows his master who is and who is not, the same shall be beaten with many stripes. Because he knows what his master teaches about. He knows his master's commitment. He knows his master's destination. But he just refused to deal with it. And because of that, he will be beaten with many stripes. And that's what God expected of us. God expects that we took up the task of influencing commitment to those that will carry the torch after our departure. He set his vision on the future. We are those he had developed would catalyze a movement to change the world. That should be the vision of the leader. Jesus' leadership was commitment to common purpose rather than lead by only agenda. What is our agenda for today? What is our vision for the company? What is our organization? No, Christ gives relationship with people to forge a common purpose with them. A few stories in the Bible concludes with Jesus saying to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. From now on, you will no longer catch fish, but men will be your catch. And Jesus, Peter had never catched men before. He doesn't know how to catch men. He only knows how to catch fish. Jesus was telling him, the spirit of catching fish in you, I'm going to change it. I'm going to teach you another fishing method. This time, you will not need hook. This time, you will not need nets. But you will have a spiritual net, which will be cast, and you will catch men to the fold of the ministry. That was enough for Peter to follow. Peter, do not be afraid. In Luke chapter 5, from verse 10 to 11, Luke chapter 5, from verse 10 to 11, Jesus told Peter, from now on, you will be catching men. Simon and others came to believe that Jesus was committed to their highest kingdom potential. So Jesus' purpose came in and they believed in him. So the question is today, do you believe in God? If you don't believe in God, it's going to be difficult for you to catch men. And for you to catch men, let's read Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Luke 5, verse, from verse 10 to 12. Luke 5, 10 to 12. I read. He says, So were James Jones and the son of Zebedee, Simeon partner. The Jesus said to Simeon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boat up to the shore and left everything and followed him. While Jesus was in one of the town, a man came along. To whom was over covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, I am willing. And he said, Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Remember, what he did. The man asked him if he was willing to heal him. He can make him come. And Jesus did not say, Oh, I am willing, but I will not do it. But he said, Yes, I am willing. Be thou clean. And the Bible said the leprosy left the man immediately. So the question you ask yourself today, are you willing? The Bible says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the goods of the land. Christ's leadership format is a leadership we must emulate if we must reach our potential. Remember what he told his follower. He said, except you abide in me, and I in you. I'm <laughs> sorry, you will bear fruit, but your fruit will not remain. But what did he say? If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear fruit and your fruit will remain. Today, the only way we can have fruit and make it remain is if we abide in the Lord. 
and the Lord abides in us. Today, God expects us to abide in Him so that we can bear the fruits, that our fruits can be useful for His purpose. So, brethren, this is where we're going to end today's teaching. But before we end today's teaching, I just want you to understand. Our leadership guarantees the team we are going to have. What kind of team do you envy for yourself? Do you want a team where you, whenever a member is sick, they will call you on phone and say, Brother, Pastor, so so and so, a brother in the church is sick, we need you. Or what kind of leader do you want to be? A leader that will tell you, Oh, sorry, when we were in the service yesterday, sister died, but don't worry, we have worked him up. Or what kind of leadership do you want to exhibit? Is it the kind of leader? That when a team has headache, they will need to call you on the phone, or the person close by can just lay hand on the headache and say, get up. And the person should say, oh, yes, yesterday we have this, it's testimony time. And I tell you, if you are the second part of leadership, you will live longer, and you will live a well refreshed life. But if you are in the first set of leadership, that want all the work to be done by you. You will wear out before your time. You will not go very far. You will be like Moses when he complained to God and said, God, did I carry these people in my womb? Did I carry all this whole nation? Why should you say to me that I should bear them up in my arms? You will be that kind of leader. But if you are in the second role of leadership, carrying the people will be as easy as carrying a piece of bread. You will not feel it. Because why? Everybody will help each other. Everybody you save in the service of God has ability to save one or two people. And remember, everybody has a gift. Nobody was created empty. And the moment you know that, help them to put that gift to use. You will have an easier ministry. God bless you. I have been teaching you. My name is Missionary Collins. And I am the founder of Christian Books Foundation. You can join our Open House Fellowship every Tuesday by 7 p.m. Before we pray, I want to remind you that if you have missed any of our episode, you can go and get it on our website, which is cgfnslogin.app. Or you can check on Open Heart Fellowship on Facebook. You can still get most of the video there. God bless you. And we hope to see you next week. But before we pray, if you want God to make you a leader that you desire, you are tired of laboring alone, you want God to help you, stretch your hand towards this TV as we pray right now. Father, we thank you for whom you are. We thank you for your leadership staff. We thank you for your organization staff. We thank you for your good name. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your blessing. Lord, stretch your hand upon every soul that are pointing towards this TV or computer or phone right now. Lord, stretch your hands upon their life. Make them the leader you desire them to be. Lord, the, the harvest is truly ripe. Right. But the laborers of you. You are the God of Sabbaths. You are the God of harvest. Send more laborers into your field. Lord, make these ones your laborers. As many that are sick, heal them and prepare them for the service. As many that are in bondage, set them loose and bring them to the service. As many that are in darkness, let a great light shine and bring them to your service. Father, draw men, draw children, draw women, draw them to your name. That in everything your name will know will take preeminence. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you, brethren. This is where we end for today. And we would like to see you next week, the same time, on Tuesday, 7 p.m. God bless you as you come.